Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Trouble gets all the attention. Well, this time you're getting the spotlight tonight, Mowgli. This is my other little troublemaker, Miss May Mowgli. And we named her that after that character in that movie, The Help. Because when she was, when she first came here, again, it was Jamie who named her because she started telling her, uh, speaking in her voice, you know, I is cute, I is fluffy, I is loved. <laughs> and yes, she is. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Finally. Yeah. Hi there. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, but we agreed with it. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Hi there, everyone. Once again, welcome back to Cast Iron Wednesday. And I know I say the same thing every week because, well, the same thing happens every week. On Wednesday, a lot of these uh, cast iron. Well, not just cast iron. A lot of these cooking channels uh, decide to uh, do a video about uh, cooking in cast iron. And it's become something of a YouTube tradition called Cast Iron Wednesday. And so, once again, here we are. I've uh, really enjoyed uh, this uh, these uh, live videos myself as well. And so that's why I have a lot of fun here uh, on this uh, Cast Iron Wednesday. Especially because of, well, the people who actually show up at these things. And as always... Thank you so much. Um, tonight, as the title notes, we are going to be doing two things anyway. We're making us some uh, some tortillas because I do have a project in progress where I am going to need a bunch of tortillas. But also, not only besides that, um, well... <clears throat> I mentioned already uh, that uh, this week here in Massachusetts, finally, the uh, Brimfield Antique Show has opened up for the first time since 2019. Yeah, they were shut down because of the coronavirus pandemic, like many other uh, big festivals. But <clears throat> they are open at last, and that, of course, gives an incentive to uh, talk about uh, a very popular subject among our crowd, and that would be the hunt, namely treasure hunting for uh, vintage cast iron because, yeah, there is a lot to be said about that, and that's really one of the things that makes this hobby so much fun. So anyway, hello again to everyone. Jimmy Langford, wow, look at all that Griswold. Oh, yeah, that's right, in the, uh, in the uh, title photo there. And hello again to Mr. Cast Iron, and thank you again for having me on your show last Sunday. Uh, hello to Pibgorn and Bookworm73 and William Hurt and Fluffy Otter as well. As always, it's always nice to see you folks. So thank you uh, once again, you know, for showing up. Um, yeah, as I mentioned already, it's the uh, uh, Brimfield Antique Show is taking place here. But, of course, but I mean, of course, I mean, I'm really excited about it because it is one of probably one of the biggest and best um antique fairs in the entire country. But on the other hand, yeah, we're hardly the only one to have these really great antique shows. I mean, uh, down there, I know a lot of people are watching down there down south. You have uh, certain times of the year as well where you folks go on, uh, the, on the hunt. I mean, yes, I know we could say every weekend when the yard sales are in bloom <laughs> and the uh, flea markets. But in addition, of course, you do have those special events, those Highway yard sales, you know, such as the world's longest yard sale and the Route 127 yard sale and a whole bunch of other things like that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I actually posted on a uh, Boston based discussion board the possibility of us of the state uh, organizing some kind of a highway yard sale here in Massachusetts, because I'd certainly like to take part in that, but nothing came of it. So right now, I guess we're, uh, well, no, we do have a lot of uh, smaller antique fairs, but of course the best known is Brimfield. <laughs> so anyway, yes, uh, I haven't seen other live Cast Iron Wednesday screen streams. Well, I do believe there's one going on right now at, uh, at that other guy's uh, channel, the mud brooker so <laughs> but nonetheless i mean obviously it's and thank you very much everybody for showing up to watch this one um but yeah <clears throat> on the title photo that was just one 
of many photos I've taken at Brimfield. So that's a uh, big reason why I am looking forward to uh, heading back to Brimfield. The, the show actually started yesterday. And actually, I better, instead of just standing here talking, I think let's do something. So let me get back to that. Um, as I mentioned already, here comes once again the uh, roller coaster that we do every week. There we go. I haven't seen any other cast on Wednesdays. Yeah. Are you trying to cheat? Yeah. Are you cheating? Are you trying to cheat? Yeah, exactly. Seeing somebody um, else on the side? Mm -hmm. Oh, right. boy. First of all, of course, we've got to show some cast iron. And so for this one, I've broken out one of my all-time favorite uh, kitchen users. This, of course, is my BSR, Birmingham Stove and Range, Red Mountain number eight. Uh, which I have had for several years. And this thing likely dates from the, uh, I would date it personally. Well, yeah, of course I date it. I think it's sexy, but I would probably date it to the uh, 1940s to the 1960s. My reasoning for it is because of the lettering here. Um, yes, uh, BSR did do those uh, handwritten pans in the earliest days of their history, the 1930s and possibly earlier, but I believe it was after that when they actually uh, put, when they actually started uh, putting some professional looking markings on their molds there. It could have been in the late 30s or maybe the uh, 1940s. And it lasted like that until BSR completely redesigned their pans when automated uh, production came in in the 1960s. So that's why I would estimate this to be somewhere between the 1940s to 1960s. I don't have any other way to get a more accurate date on it, but it's good enough. I've been heating this thing for about um, maybe about 15 minutes now. And so that means we get to make ourselves some tortillas. And hello again to Andrew Bonificio. Good to be here. And Fluffy Otter and William Hertz. Um, and oh, yes. And yeah, that's right. Uh, no, yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, Jamie, somebody heard your comment there. Pib Gorn is saying, no, Jamie, we are loyal to CIC. That's well, right. <laughs> but if you didn't want to go, like, you know, visit and take a peek, you know, there's no harm in looking, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Anyway, there we go. We should have a good view that way, both ways. Um, so anyway, yeah, within just the past hour, I whipped myself a um, batch of uh, tortilla dough. And yeah, I, I've really, I've only been making tortillas for a very short period of time, but I'm really enjoying these things. No, we have not stopped buying store-bought tortillas. I mean, they're, you know, they're very convenient and they're cheap and you can grab them whenever you want. However, um, really homemade tortillas are so easy to make and when I found out about how easy they were yeah you better believe I fell in love with these things especially since they taste so much better than the stuff from the store now there's really nothing wrong with those basic bland store-bought tortillas I mean they're fine but really once you start uh, making these things yourself you will, you will be amazed at the difference. And yes, uh, I did uh, learn the important thing about uh, having a really tasty tortilla. And that is, of course, if you're going to do a tortilla, you've got to make it with lard. Not uh, olive oil, not vegetable oil, not flaxseed oil. <laughs> I wouldn't make it with flaxseed oil anyway, but lard. And it's really no more than just mixing the dough until it's um, a, you know, until really you can uh, definitely take, you can smell, how can you describe it? It gives this, well, lard is, of course, uh, pig fat, so there's definitely something of a pork smell to it. And I guess you could say that even gets into, come on, uh, that gets into the taste as well. So one thing I also found is that, um, I know they talk about uh, rolling these things to be like about an eighth of an inch, eighth of an inch or so in size, but I found it actually seems to work better if I try to make these things as thin as possible. And it's really no more than just rolling it out. The dough itself, again, is so easy. It's really no more than flour with some um, salt and a little baking powder uh, mixed in. Not baking soda, don't worry, baking powder. Only a little bit, just to help it rise. And, of course, most importantly, the lard. Praise the lard. 
then from there you just simply mix in warm water and stir it all around until you get yourself a nice shaggy dough then you do have to let it rest for a little bit so that the gluten will relax that's the other thing as i've found out the hard way let's turn this over once again and once well, only a little bit more, I guess, and we will have our first tortilla. This is no, I'm, I, like everything else, I'm still an amateur at doing this. Uh, and yes, I know about a cast iron tortilla press. In fact, I have a cast iron tortilla press. Here it is um, right here. Let me do this right. This is, in fact, a cast iron tortilla press, but especially with these um, flour tortillas. I really found the uh, tortilla press did not do a great job at all in um, in uh, pressing these things out because, of course, of the gluten. Namely, the uh, dough just springs back. And so it was not really, you know, the result was nowhere near as good as I had hoped. And so that's why I have settled for doing it the hard way with ye old rolling pin. But of course, once that's done, the hard part is over because this is only going to take really maybe less than one minute to uh, cook this thing in the red mountain pan. Let's, come on, let's peel this off. And that's why I'm using wax paper too, for that matter. There we go. Gently and... There we go, bam, more or less. Well, there's a start for you. Again, in a nice hot cast iron pan, this thing should start uh, shrinking and curling up pretty quickly, in fact. So, um, okay, I'm all doing that. Hello, Pegtooth, uh, sitting in, oh, Papa Dan is here, sitting in the hospital room without internet or good TV channels. Makes for long days, ouch. Oh yeah, that's right, you're still seeing your, your dad in the hospital. My condolences again, Papa Dan. So, long well, he's still around. Invent an extension handle for short uh, handled large skillets. <laughs> well, fortunately, um, Lodge did that already when they uh, released their Black Lock series, though, so that certainly helps. And furthermore, there are other brands of cast iron and even modern day cast iron that uh, do have the longer handles. All right, now we flip it over. Hmm. Now, a nice light brown color. I might actually want to crank up the heat a little bit more because I do want a wee bit of char on this, but only a bit. Still, that wasn't hard at all for our first tortilla. This also reminds me, uh, what did I do? Oh yeah, gotta get something to cover these things. Always forget something. Let me pull out a plate here. Yeah, always forget something no matter what. And so this thing stiffens up nicely. I don't think it's quite done yet, in fact. I better, again, I better keep it on there for a little bit and maybe even turn this up to a little bit more to medium, so. Um, but yeah, I've got, I'm aiming to do about a dozen of these tortillas here. My typing sucks. <laughs> well, no, no, believe me, that, does, that can't compare to mine, that's for sure. So say hi to the kids right now. <laughs> But nonetheless, in addition to the tortillas, as I mentioned already, we're talking a little bit about uh, the hunt. Because, uh, yeah, that's um, this uh, particular Red Mountain pan, I will admit, yes, I actually did get this one off of eBay. However, I do have a fair number of uh, cast iron pans that I did manage to find in the hunt, the antique hunt for vintage cast iron, because you never know what you're going to find. And, of course, that's looking a little bit better now. And that, of course, is uh, really the main reason why uh, people, why you do this. Um, I mean, what can you say? You know, cast iron really has such a unique history. Um, let's try it this way. People, of course, as you know, really want to cook in the best possible utensils that they can afford. I mean, they really, I mean, we all really want high quality stuff 
to cook in our kitchen. And uh, that's why a lot of people do actually uh, go the distance and they get these expensive chef's knives and these so-called waterless stainless steel um, pans as well as um, copper pans and, and a whole lot of expensive things. And so on the other hand though, cast iron has had such an interesting history let me put this over here. There we go. Cast iron has had such an interesting history because really there is indeed a good chance that the very best quality uh, cast iron pens ever made can be found in junkyards, at flea markets, at yard sales. Uh, you never know where they're going to show up. And of course, that is uh, what really attracts us to the hunt and why so many of us uh, really love going to yard sales and antique malls and uh, flea markets and the like. I think I've mentioned already, there is actually a, a, a small but popular flea market only a few blocks from where I live as well. And that one there is really, unfortunately, probably not in, not in the safest neighborhood in the city. <laughs> a lot of trash pickers come there. And yeah, there is a lot of junk to be found at that place. Let me move the uh, camera back over again. There is a lot of junk to be found at that place. There's no denying that. And in fact, quite often, I mean, I think I'm finding myself going there just about every Sunday, in fact, but I'm not there very long. However, I have, in fact, made some incredible scores there, which is one reason why I keep going back. Because, yeah, even at a place where trash pickers go, you never know what you're going to find. It really requires patience more than anything else. I mean, I know it's um, one thing that a lot of people say, especially when talking about hunting for a vintage cast iron, they usually say, there's never anything in my neighborhood. I mean, all of the good deals are, I see you people with all those incredible scores and I never find anything good like that myself. All I can say to that is to be patient because I certainly felt that way myself when I first started this hobby 10 years ago. That's the thing. My collection here in my kitchen is the result of 10 years at least of uh, hunting and, and uh, searching and uh, looking for bargains all over the place, not just here in the Northeast, but even on, but also on road trips. I think I'll find another piece of black paper already. So, it can take months. It may even take years before you make your first good score, but you never know when it's going to happen. And that's the thing. It always, and I mean always, happens when you least expect it. I mean, as I mentioned already, that place down the, down the street there with the uh, where all the trash pickers go, believe me, I was flabbergasted when just one day, just by chance, I came across a Griswold. And not just a Griswold, a Victor Griswold. You know, the one that actually has the big logo saying Victor, and it says the Griswold Company on it. And then not only that, it was a number nine size, too. So it was a really, really valuable pan. And you know how much the uh, vendor was selling that pan for? Five bucks. I kid you not. I managed to score that pan for five bucks. And how come I have never shown that pan in any of my videos? Because I gave it away as a present. Especially because I managed to score it for five bucks. I felt it would be nice to uh, give that as a present to one of my co-workers, whose name is, of course, Victor. <laughs> because why not? I mean, really, I was absolutely thrilled to have made that score, yes. But, I mean... Beyond that, well, as I've said enough times, I've got it so much of a, I've got a, enough of a collection here that I really, I have to keep telling myself, I really don't need any more skillets. <laughs> because, yes, it would probably be a nice display piece. I don't want display pieces. I want users. And so that's why I ended up giving that valuable Griswold which I probably could have sold on eBay for close to $200, or even on the more reasonable cast iron groups um, for at least $100. I gave it away as a present. 
and I have no regrets about that. And I'm going to stop bragging about that right now. However, that does bring up something else that I'm uh, that is worth mentioning. Um, about the best place to go that I know of to look for vintage cast iron is Facebook. Yes, Facebook, not eBay. Definitely not eBay. <laughs> we all have our horror stories about eBay. But on the other hand, the Facebook cast iron community has indeed gotten together and founded several groups on Facebook, especially for selling cast iron. And the best part is, is that they do their best to keep everything honest. eBay, as you know, is a free-for-all. On eBay, I mean, really, it's like they're a rip-off artists. Um, and furthermore, eBay's prices are absolutely outrageous. It's only rare indeed that I find a piece of cast iron on eBay that I consider to be a decent deal. On the other hand, the Facebook community... Uh, yeah, let me name the Facebook group, in fact. It is called um, Iron Man Cast Iron Auctions. And here's another nice one. Nice one right here. Oh, yeah, this one's actually very good. It's called Iron Man Cast Iron Auctions. And if you're on Facebook and you don't know about that group already, go ahead and look for it. Um, as I said already, it is run by... Uh, by good collectors who have a, who have sterling reputations, and they do their best to police the group and make sure that everything is done honestly. Which is also why I do not want the cast iron cooking group on Facebook to be a place for selling cast iron. A couple reasons for that. One is that <clears throat> I like those selling groups like Iron Man. I mean, they're especially dedicated to selling, and they do a great job managing the group. On the other hand, uh, if I were to allow selling, or if we were to allow selling on the Cast Iron Cooking Group on Facebook, we would end up having to deal with money arguments. We would have to put a whole lot of uh, rules in place, especially to manage selling of cast iron. And just as important, the group itself, the Cast Iron Cooking Group, would become a selling group rather than a cooking group. I mean, people would go there to sell cast iron, and that's not what we want that group for. The Cast Iron Cooking Group is especially for there for people to go to show off their cooking, their cast iron cooking. Oh, that, that one doesn't look too bad. And so we want, that is what we want people to go there for. We do, you, where you can go and, uh, you, and you can watch some amazing, amazing photos of people like you and me who have uh, put some, who have made some incredible creations in cast iron. If you want to buy cast iron, like I said, go to groups on uh, Facebook like Iron Man Cast Iron Auctions. We like those groups and we want you to visit them because you can get some good deals there. And I do indeed highly recommend that. Let's see what else do we have. Terry Sinchev, late again. Not really, no. I mean, after all, we're only we're here and we only just started. Hey, GOG, just chilling and eating a burger. <laughs> uh, William Hart, got my number nine Grizz for 10 bucks. Oh, really? I mean, if you want to uh, type a couple of sentences and uh, tell us your story, I mean, please do so. I would indeed like to hear some stories here because I'm sure... A number of people have made some really good scores here. I have done some, I've found some incredible stuff at Brimfield, and that's one reason why I am so psyched to be going back there again. Uh, a fair number of the best pieces in my kitchen I was lucky enough to discover at Brimfield. Not all of them, but uh, quite a few of them. One of my chef's knives, in fact, the K-Bar chef knife came from Brimfield. Um, it was at Brimfield that I found my... 15 gallon cast iron cauldron. I actually found that and it was actually at a price that I could afford. And that was when at that time, um, I just said to myself that if I did not splurge and, and get this, I would be kicking myself for the rest of my life because I have no idea when, if ever, I might be able to find a deal like that again. So I took the uh, plunge in that case, and I ended up with a 15-gallon cast iron cauldron from the 1800s. So, yes, I'm very, very happy with that. On the other hand, 
I've gone on some road trips, even down south, as I've mentioned, to visit the National Cornbread Festival. And there are some really, really nice flea markets along the, along the route there that I can definitely recommend. And in fact, if folks want to recommend their favorite places to uh, look for cast iron, they can certainly do so. I can think of just off of Binghamton, New York, on the border of Pennsylvania, there is a Sunday flea market. I think it's called Jimay's, G-I-M-A-Y. That's an awesome place, and I found some really great stuff there. I even found a, um, a BSR Red Mountain there after I cleaned it up. I gave it to a friend of mine who lives in the Binghamton area. And I also found at that place a uh, Gatemark griddle that I gave to my, uh, g to my good friends who live in Oneonta. Okay, I think this one's about done here. And they use that one regularly, so I'm quite happy about that. Um, that's only on the border of New York. If we head a little further south into Pennsylvania, I know that they're uh, just outside the Harrisburg area. There's a really nice flea market out there. Let me turn the camera again. There's a really nice flea market uh, they're in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area called Saturday's Market. And yeah, based, uh, yeah, exactly. The name is exactly what you think. They are, in fact, open on Saturdays rather than Sundays. But they are a really good flea market. They are huge. I mean, it's one of the biggest flea markets I've been to. I will say that. It's probably like a quarter mile in length or so. And um, it is packed with tons and tons of all the stuff that you would expect to find at flea markets. All the collector booths, all the places selling cheap clothes. Um, and it's also in Amish country. And there are several Mennonite um, vendors there at that flea market as well who, do, who sell some wonderful, wonderful homemade food. It was in one of my trips to Pennsylvania that I tried rhubarb pie for the first time. I bought it at a um, Mennonite vendor, in fact. It might have even been at that very flea market, the Saturday's market outside of Harrisburg. And I loved it. I had never had rhubarb before. And oh yeah, I'm definitely gonna have it again when I'm, when I'm down by that area. Of course, it had been homemade and specially prepared by people who know how to make rhubarb. <laughs> so I lucked out like that. And yes, as well, um, there are quite a few, or last time I was there, there were quite a few cast iron vendors there at Saturday's Market. Um, there's a huge parking area where a whole lot of outdoor vendors, uh, yeah, these, these things are getting holes in them very quickly. Where a huge parking lot area where a lot of outdoor vendors set up their stands. And uh, there were indeed some uh, cast iron vendors selling them, selling some really nice pieces at, uh, well, unfortunately, very high prices. But, well, what do you expect? I mean, they knew, that they knew their market. It was there, in fact, at uh, Saturday's Market, again, that's outside of Harrisburg, that I saw my very first um, Marietta skillet. Um, those of you who know the Marietta Cast Iron Foundry, which was, in fact, based in Pennsylvania. Boy, am I out of wax paper already? Huh. That was based in Pennsylvania. Um, Marietta pots are actually fairly common among uh, places where you can get 19th century cast iron. And there are quite, and quite a few of them uh, to be had, too. But that was the first time I ever saw a skillet with the Marietta logo on it. And I think it was like about, it might have even been a 12 inch skillet too, not something small. It was 12 inch. And it was sporting a $50, a 50 price tag. Now, I was on a limited budget and the $50 price tag was the main reason why I did not get it. Because again, I have plenty of skillets. I really don't need another skillet. Uh, but it was beautiful to look at. And yes, it was indeed very tempting. And again, these are the type of things you can find if you look for them. Also there on that, on that road trip in the Pennsylvania area, though, I, um, that was on a Saturday, you know, Saturday's market. After going to Saturday's market, 
I roamed around the countryside and visited some yard sales. And it was at one of those yard sales on that same day that I scored. Um, I found one person who was having her own yard sale. And she was selling not one, but two BSR number eight century skillets. No, not Red Mountain, but still, they were century skillets. Um, and there were two of them. And she was selling them for $8 a piece. And so I said, well, how about $15 for the two of them? And she said, sure. And that was the time I did indeed get two BSR Century skillets for $15. Now, I'm not really trying to brag. I'm Yes, I'm proud of those scores. I can't deny that. But the point is just that. You never know when these uh, when these kind of uh, deals are going to come out suddenly and jump out at you. I mean, I certainly was not expecting it. You never expect it, but eventually, if you you know if you have patience and you search long enough, you will find yourself a good score. I can practically guarantee it, but I don't know how long it's going to take for you. And that's um, God. And so far, I've only gotten as far as Pennsylvania. I mean, I've I mean, I've gone down to Tennessee, you know, for on my road trips too. So what else do we have here? Let uh, let me let's get this in the pan, and then I will quickly uh, look at a couple of comments here. I hope I didn't put the wax paper away. I'm getting a feeling I'm going to need quite a bit more of it. I mean, so far, I think I've only done two of these uh, of these tortillas. That's all right. I mean, if I don't finish all of them by the end of this evening, that's not a problem. It's better, I think, than finishing all of them too soon. Come on. Let's do this right, shall we? There we go. There we go. And now comes... Oops, that, did, that didn't work. Let's try that again. Yeah, it's folding. All right, there we go, more or less. Okay, what do we have here again? Bob S., that was very nice of those ladies. <laughs> nice scores, William Hurt. <laughs> Hope you can get back to those sales soon. Bob S., I just bought two skillets I don't need from Walmart. <laughs> yeah, we're going Walmart 16 and 12 inches <laughs> um, for 10 and 16 brand new. Those are nice prices. Yes, I will say that. Yard sales and flea markets are picking up again, and there will be lots of deals. Now we can only we can certainly hope so. Terry Sinchep, my grandma was the assistant pastry chef in a big hotel in Minneapolis in the 30s. She made the best rhubarb pie. Oh, I don't doubt it. I am I envy you. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Langford, I picked up a BSR Century Series three quart stock pot. Nice uh, with a lid today. Oh yeah, it's going in the e tank to soon. Well, it definitely sounds like you made yourself a really good score, and I'm impressed about that. You can, uh, Papa Dan, you can find BSR Century pretty easy in North Louisiana, but not <laughs> Red Mountain. No, that's true. Whoops. Well, this is going pretty fast. Get this out now. Yeah, we certainly Boy, this temperature sure uh, shot up. Okay, lower the temperature in the pan a little bit. Fortunately, it's only a little bit of char. It's not, um, it's not ruined. <laughs> but, yeah, I definitely got to watch myself now. Hey, what else do we have? Yeah, I scroll back a little bit. Did I miss anything here? Yard sales and flea markets? No, we said that part. Um, here we are. William Hart. I shopped two neighborhood food yard sales, oh, neighborhood yard sales, sorry, in the same weekend, scored the Grizz and the number six unmarked Wagner and the number eight Wagner, but uh, last score before the pandemic. Yeah, that's why, as they mentioned, you know, there's going to be some nice scores here uh, because, you know, people have been waiting inside for the last year or so, so who knows what we're going to find. Well, what we've already been finding. I mean, after all, yard sales have already started. Brimfield has only just started now, but there have been things going on already. <laughs> hey, 
And yeah, um, let me see. I've gotten as far as Pennsylvania. Um, oh yes, Southern Pennsylvania, right off the Mason-Dixon line, is a wonderful antique mall that I've been to a few times. Even I even went there last year. You saw that video when I uh, took my mom's ashes and uh, to Gettysburg, and oh, that's hot. Yeah, no good. Sorry about that. Let's do this right. There we go. When I took my mom's ashes to Gettysburg and spread them there. Excuse me one second. There we go. Anyway, uh, on what is it? The main road south? Oh, yeah, 95 south, of course. <laughs> Just about uh, 25 uh, 20 miles from Gettysburg. In fact, it's the uh, exit that you get off of uh, Route 95 to, to get on to, you know, to head towards Gettysburg. There is a really, really great antique mall there, and I hope they're still in business, you know, pandemic and all that. Um, a really great antique mall there uh, called the Black Rose. And in that place, it is actually in the remains of a shopping mall, unfortunately. And I'm, that's why there's always the possibility that they could go out of business, unfortunately. We're talking like a big shopping mall, you know, the kind that would normally have several dozen stores in it. Uh, however, for the last couple of years, that particular shopping mall has been practically abandoned, unfortunately. And that must be why they allowed the Black Rose to come in there, because it is a really, really big antique mall. I mean, you know, most antique stores are, are pretty small. This one was probably like the size of a Kmart. In fact, it was probably in a Kmart, in fact, or what had once been a Kmart. It was that big. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of stands from all kinds of vendors there. And I have seen cast iron at that place at really, really good prices too. Um, it was there um, a couple of years ago that I found a nice gate-marked um, skillet that I, uh, again, sent away to a friend as a present. Uh, where did that... Oh, there it is, the rolling pin. It was also there just last year that I scored not cast iron this time, but a Corel uh, butter dish to match my Corel plates that I enjoy so much and people seem to like. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm, and I saw some great cast iron hanging in those places, some of which were indeed very tempting because even the prices did not seem too bad. Antique malls are still expensive, yes, but there were some great things there. I mean, I'm certain. No, I definitely saw a Wapak Indian head there, and I'm thinking it was a semi-decent price. We're talking maybe around $120 or so, and the collector value of the Wapak Indian head I would say that would probably be not a bad price. That's just one example. I mean, that's a really good place. Um, 95 South in Pennsylvania, right near the uh, Mason-Dixon line, near the Maryland border. If you look it up on Google, I mean, you can find anything on Google these days. You will see the Black Rose uh, Antique Mall. And it's definitely, again, if you happen to be in the area, it's definitely worth it. When I went to Gettysburg last year, yes, I did spend maybe a, a half a day or so wandering the area around it. And I did come across a couple of nice antique places. There was one as well, I forget the name of it, that had some, well, it had an, some, um, you know, some nice selections. Um, you think that in the Gettysburg area, there might be more Civil War-oriented cast iron, but I really did not find much of that. I did find a fair amount of the usual, you know, Griswold, Wagner, and a fair amount of Antique Lodge. Most of the time, the vendors did not know what it was, so they just called it an antique cast iron pan. <laughs> One of them, um, I decided, one of those sites, I decided to be nice, and I left a note uh, attached to the, uh, well, their, uh, the stand where, the, uh, where he was selling a single-notch lodge. 
He didn't know what it was, but I pointed out that it was, in fact, a single notch lodge. And those are actually fairly rare as far as antique lodge go. I've been thinking about that, and I have a theory about the single notch lodge in, in particular. Um, first of all, of course, you know, the three notch lodge has been in production or was in production from the 1940s or 30s all the way up to at least the 1980s. So, yeah, there are a lot more of those three notch lodge. But even so, consider that the Great Depression took place during the 1920s to 1930s, right around the time Lodge was producing those single notch pans. So their production numbers certainly went down in those days. Not only that, immediately after the, um, after the depression, of course, came World War II. And then came the war effort. In particular, the scrap drives of World War II which I know are very patriotic and it's a very nice piece of history. But as those of us in our hobby know, a lot of cast iron pans were recycled for the war effort. So, well, it's history. It happened. Nothing we can do about it. So just accept that. <laughs> um, but even so, uh, consider as well, that means that a fair number of lodge pans in those days were certainly recycled, and that would have mean a lot of lodge single notch pans. So combine that with the depression, the result is the number of single notch lodge pans out there, it would have to be considerably smaller than the number of three notch lodge pans out there. So if you have a single notch lodge pan, I would say just for that reason alone, certainly something of a collector's item, and you have yourself a very nice heirloom. So use it with pride. Almost done getting this thing off. And here we go again. Oh, that one turned out okay. I just gotta be sure not to burn this one. <laughs> uh, Jason Utas. I recently picked up a single notch lodge. It has a bumped out area on the... In on it near seven o'clock where an arc logo was ground out of the mold. Huh, that's interesting. Peg tooth, I remember bringing up that point about recycling metal, LOL. Yes, stuff vanished and were turned into uh, router drums. Yeah, well, I'm, well, that's history and that's how it worked. So <laughs> nothing we can really, you know, we can't bring them back from the dead. So we can just accept that history happened and it was for a good reason too. And it means that the ones we have are all the more valuable. Come on. Don't tell me this thing's sticking. Please don't tell me this is sticking. There we go. And I did turn the temperature down too. Shit. Well, I guess that's what I get for cooking in a BSR. Anyway, uh, Terry Sinchev, I made a grilled ham and cheese in my single notch lodge today. <laughs> Bob S. Whoa, Harbor Freight doubled the price on spiders. Yeah, I noticed that. For whatever reason, they doubled the price of their cast iron Dutch ovens uh, over the past year or so. They used to sell for like $30 to $35. Now they're selling them for like $70. I don't, I don't, I can't understand it. I can only assume it's because their production during the pandemic must have gone way down. So that... So that means they, they would have compensated by jacking up the price, I guess. Perhaps the price will go down again. But I certainly can't speak for Harbor Freight Tools. <laughs> um, helpful hints that those want to try it with a car battery charger. Oh, yeah, that's... Um, oh, you're talking about an e-tank, the electrolysis tank. Um, well, the biggest tip for an, for an e-tank or an electrolysis tank, boy, that would be a subject of a video in itself, is that you have to find a manual battery charger. And they're not very easy to find these days, unfortunately. Just about all of them are automatic. And the reason why is because an automatic battery charger will turn off at a certain uh, level of voltage. And it's really, oh yeah, let me show that again so far. So far, so good. Yeah, I definitely need to turn this down. This is starting to char, unfortunately. 
But anyway, yes, um, automatic battery chargers will turn off and you will really not do a good job of uh, restoring any uh, pants with an automatic charger in an e-tank. Um, okay, let me quickly, well, let me turn, turn this camera over again. I think I better, well, like it or not, I better get out some wax paper. Wax paper is not expensive. I mean, I, I mean as much as I'm trying to conserve it, I mean, really, it's, there's no reason why I can't put out a couple more pieces here. Um, so that would probably be my best tip for using a car charger. Other than that, if you manage to find a manual battery charger, that is an excellent tool for uh, just that, for building an e-tank. And it's probably the, probably the most common thing used, in fact. I have, I, yes, I have built an e-tank and I've used it, but nowhere near the ones who do it on a regular basis and have restored hundreds of pans with it. So, like just about everything else in this hobby, I'm an amateur. Yeah, I mean, yet again, I have to say that I'm an amateur. I am no, I am nowhere near an expert at it. I very much appreciate advice from anyone uh, regarding these things. And likewise, please feel free to say so here, too. Make sure I haven't scrolled up too much. My battery charger is a vintage, ooh, apple green, old school. <laughs> Supply and demand, yes, exactly. <laughs> so, I never imply that you can't cook off a rotor drum. <laughs> well, sure, I mean, you could always use it to make a UDS, an ugly drum smoker. Uh, made it through ham and cheese, yeah. Production down, and lots more people started cooking at home for quor in quarantine kitchens. Yes, exactly. But since everybody is trying to get back to the way we were before the pandemic, I don't know if that'll ever happen, but people are trying. Well, if nothing else, that should hopefully mean that business at places like Harbor Freight Tools is picking up. Because, yeah, I know. Harbor Freight Tools is the cheap Asian little brother of Home Depot. And, yes, there are some harsh words that can be said about that company. Yet. You can get some nice cheap stuff there. The quality of some of it is really not that great. And that includes the cast iron Dutch ovens that they sell there. But they're good enough. If you just, if you want what we could call disposable cast iron, something to take out camping, where if it gets ruined or stolen or who knows what, you're really not out a lot of money. And it's not a big deal as opposed to taking a valuable Griswold out on a camping trip. Well, okay, I know, it's more expensive now, and that's kind of the whole point that you said. But, well, here's hoping again that as business picks up, the cost will go down, we hope. All right, let's do this again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Boy, I've only done five of these tortillas. I am hardly doing this at a, at a rushing pace, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, okay, so far I've mentioned, as I said, I've mentioned, um, antique malls, at least, uh, north of the border, and I've mentioned flea markets, and I love flea markets, and I enjoy yard sales. <laughs> um, once we get south of the border, of course, that's where we get into places like West Virginia and Virginia. Yeah, as you can see, I'm following that route because that's the route that I've taken on my road trips down south. Virginia, of course, has its famous Antiques Row down Route 95, or is it 81 or 76? I, I forget. Um, but you know what I mean, the, uh, you know, the main highway down that goes through central Virginia. And yeah, a lot of towns there do have what they call antique stops. Some of them are pretty good antique malls. Some of them are not. <laughs> One of the best that I have come across is pretty famous, and I'm betting a lot of people may know about this one already, just off of Staunton, Virginia. It's called The Factory Antique Mall. This is another one of those giant antique malls that's easily the size of a, of a whole supermarket or or Lowe's or the like. 
where you've got hundreds and hundreds of booths there, and you can just roam through that place the entire day. It's called The Factory, and again, if you, it, um, you probably know about it, and it's, again, it's in um, mid-Virginia. As I said, not too far from Staunton, Virginia. And I have, and I, last time I was there, I saw an incredible collection of 19th century gate mark Dutch ovens. And the guy was selling them at fairly re decent prices, too. Coming up. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Sorry, guys. So, so, yeah, I mean, they were, yeah, granted, we're talking like still anywhere between like, 60 to 100 to maybe even $200 or so for some of them. But considering that 19th century gate mark Dutch ovens are extremely rare, that probably wouldn't be out of the question if you're a collector. It was also at the factory mall, uh, antique mall that I actually saw and got to hold in my hands the famous number 16 cast iron skillet. Some folks may have seen this, and in fact, if you look online, you'll probably see some photos of it. It is a, this gigantic skillet, you know, with a 16 on the, uh, on the handle. And it's got a very pointy end, it's got a very pointy end on it, too, like a, like a lifting handle. And since I held that thing in my hand, I found out that thing is a real monster. I mean, I swear, the pan has got away. 20 to 30 pounds just by itself. So yeah, that is, oh man, is that ever a beast. The price it was selling for at that antique mall was about $250. Now, if you were a collector, that might seriously be considered, might be worth considering. I would, did not have any trouble turning that down. <laughs> I mean, on one hand, I've got already, I have my number 14 uh, BSR, which I enjoy very much. And that's one reason why I did not have any need to spend $200 on the number 16 skillet. But it was really nice to look at. I will not deny that. <laughs> and I was really glad to be able to actually hold that thing in my hands and see it for real and not just in photos. Okay, this one. Careful. Damn it. Careful. And there we go. This one's got a nice size to it. Oh, damn it. Yeah, I folded it, unfortunately. Not much I can do about that now. <laughs> All right. Fortunately, a lot of these uh, are going to be baked anyway, so... Okay, Bookworm73, I found a gate mark Dutch oven for $10 the other day at the flea market. Oh, yeah, no lid, of course, but, but I'm in the midst of cleaning it up. Oh, yeah, $10, better believe I would have snatched that up. Congratulations. I used a large lettuce leaf as a wrap for hot rice onion cheese. Ooh, that sounds good. Curry powder tortilla. Oh, yeah, tortilla today. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. You're definitely making me hungry. I will say that too. Where did I just put? Oh, here it is. This thing's this thing's actually starting to puff up pretty fast too. Come on, don't stick. There we go. Got it. Not bad. Still charred though. Oh, and I've definitely turned the heat down too. Well, none of this is ruined. I will say that much. So. <laughs> 100% whole wheat. Well, actually, it's just all-purpose flour. <laughs> nice and simple. Great score, bookworm. I will definitely say that. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to cut down on the bread, too, Anthony Bonificio. <laughs> Thank you, Paw Pop. But anyway, what can I say? It's like I've been just describing a history of some of the uh, antiques I've seen on my road trips down south. Basically, several times uh, I've gone... I've driven here now from Massachusetts down that road through Virginia into Tennessee to the uh, National Cornbread Festival, which, of course, is held by uh, Lodge Cast Iron in South Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So anyway, Virginia has quite a few of those antique malls of that kind. Uh, some of them are pretty darn good. Some of them are not. <laughs> 
And here is where I think probably there have got to be message boards out there about uh, antique collecting where they can give opinions about which are some of the better spots for picking in, like, say, for instance, along uh, Virginia's Antique Row. And I've gone from Virginia down into Tennessee. And I can definitely say, if nothing else, uh, Tennessee. I can think of a couple of places that are worth looking for. One of which would be the Seaverville area. And that, of course, has become a gigantic tourist trap for the entire state. The Seaverville uh, area of Tennessee, as anyone who's been down there knows, there are all kinds of really huge and amazing tourist attractions in that area. Some of them are just that. They're tourist attractions. Some of them are really darn good. Dollywood is down there, and no, I have not yet visited Dolly World. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, also down there in the Seaverville area is the um oh yeah this is worth mentioning definitely the um oh my god have i long um, oh yeah that's right smoky mountain knife works that's it those of you who know that name know what i'm talking about they claim to be the largest knife selling store in the world and maybe they are they are fantastic to browse through not just for knives, I mean, but they've got an astounding collection of any kind of knife you might think of. And that includes kitchen knives. They've got a kitchen section with a not bad selection of uh, kitchen knives, too. You can get some really good stuff there. They also sell, well, naturally, they sell lots and lots and lots of guns. I'm not really a gun collector, so I don't have much to say about that. No, I don't mind it. I just say... I really know next to nothing about guns, but they sell a lot of gun stuff there. And, of course, they do indeed sell clothes and other uh, camping stuff. And, yes, they do have some selection of cast iron. Not only do they have a nice selection of lodge cast iron, but the uh, Rocky, no, Smoky Mountain Iron Works, they also have, as part of their and you know tourist attraction, they have a so they have an antique section in their basement where they do indeed have some really really nice stuff on display you know we're talking like uh, cast iron really from the civil war era i actually saw and i was tempted at the rocky at the i keep saying rocky mountain at the smoky mountain ironworks in their antique cellar i came across a gate marked dutch oven with a lid for $35. Yeah, I was sorely tempted. Oh, man, was I tempted. Um, by now, it, that was at least a couple of years ago, and it's probably gone now, so don't go rushing there looking for that. <laughs> they also have a nice selection of, of movie swords, you know, swords from famous movies and the like, but, we, you know, the usual stuff that you can see there. But, yeah, definitely the Smoky Mountain Knife Works. That is really, really worth visiting if you're in the Seabrook area, especially if you walk outside the door of the Smoky Mountain. Um, Mountain Knife Works. You know is what's right across the street from the Smoky Mountain Knife Works? A large cast iron store <laughs> right there across the street. So yeah, I mean, one of Lodge's factory stores is right there in the, in the Seaverville area. So yeah, of course I had to take a look through there <laughs> because anybody who has been to the Lodge, one of the Lodge factory store outlet stores, you know what it's like. <laughs> Boy, is that place ever a candy uh, store. <laughs> Because, I mean, on one hand, Lodge does sell their cast iron at, well, higher prices, yes, than you would see at places like Walmart. But, of course, as every, I mean, naturally, they got a much, much better variety and selection there. Um, they sell the Blacklock series there, for instance. But also, as anybody who's been to a Lodge store knows, they have the seconds section. That's the part, of course, where they take their slightly less quality and very, very slightly less quality cast iron that's all still brand new and seasoned. They season it all and put it on and sell it on these shelves at much, much lower prices. The prices there are probably what you would pay for them at Walmart, except again, they've got a much, much better selection than what you find at Walmart. 
<laughs> so yeah, and like for instance, that would the Lodge Factory store would probably be the best place, one of the best places in the world to find a lid for your cast iron. Not just Lodge cast iron, but really anything that would fit a Lodge lid. I've gotten several lids there at those places. Um, I'm, I've told everybody how I'm so fond of my Lodge cast iron wok. You can usually find a cast iron wok there at a nice, decent price. Uh, a Lodge cast iron wok, I would guess somewhere around the order of maybe $35. And that is a good price for that wok. So, <laughs> yeah, that's all in the Seaverville area. I'm not done with the Seaverville area because those who know that place may also know they've got a gigantic flea market there every weekend. I mean, huge. I mean, one of the biggest flea markets I think I've ever come across. Um, yeah, no, Brimfield, yes, it is bigger. But as far as flea markets go, that Seaverville flea market is really, really big. It's supposedly open uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Most of the vendors only open on Sunday. And it's on Sunday, of course, when you can get all kinds of stuff. I mean, what can you say? It's a really, really big flea market. There is some cheap stuff there. There is some not so great stuff there. And yes, there are some vendors who sell cast iron there. It was there at, um, where is that? Here it is. Let me get this for you. It was at that flea market that I found this. This is definitely a novelty. When I first saw this, I really wanted it, and I yeah, and I was actually shocked to to uh, discover it. This thing is, I don't know what it is. It's a mini ham boiler. It has an HB on it, and I'm wondering if it's from Lodge. But it's a perfect size for a bread pan. And yeah, I was tickled to death to find this at that flea market down there in Seaverville, and I paid fifteen dollars for it. So, yeah, there you go. That's what I mean. Yet again, you never know when you're going to find yourself a really nice score. And so far, I'm just talking about easy places to look for cast iron, too. But even so, I can only say yet again, the real point is it all depends on your having patience. Also means that you don't want to grab up every single bargain you come across unless you feel you can really, really use it. That's the other thing. Um, I mean, if you come across a Red Mountain handwritten skillet, <laughs> I'd be hard pressed to uh, pass it up. Yet I have done so. At a flea, at an antique mall, it was in Pennsylvania. I forget the name of it. Um, I actually did come across a number five handwritten BSR Red Mountain skillet. For 20 bucks, which I judged and decided to leave it there because I already have two BSR Red Mountain number no. five skillets. No, they are not handwritten. They have the more professional uh, marking on them. But honestly, it's like I already have two of these. And so it would not be worth paying 20 bucks for another one. And now the question comes, of course, well, why don't you sell it? I could. I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. I'm too wishy-washy or just too tired most of the time, I guess, to take the effort to sell cast iron. Some people do make a really good living on it. I'm just not one of them. <laughs> okay. About ready to get this one on the pan. And then we will look at some comments yet again. That's how this thing is turning out tonight. I hope you folks don't mind. You know, roll out a tortilla, put it on the pan, look at comments. Uh, I'm enjoying myself, though, I, and I hope you folks are. And so far, this will be six tortillas, so we're off to, we're off to a decent start. I'm not good, I don't know if I'm going to stay live for the entire time to do all 12 of these, but... So far, I think we're doing pretty good here. At least, I hope so. If, you, if you're not satisfied, say so. Okay, what else? Did it have a crack? Oh, huh. the general area is fun. Yes, indeed. Huh. 
bug keeps running across the stove. Oh, yeah, the, I noticed that. It's a carpenter ant. You know, nothing bad, just a carpenter ant. The cats love playing with those things. Uh, walks are great. Yeah, Book Room 73. We always cook popcorn in it. <laughs> uh, James Ramsdell uh, picked up a new number 17 double-handled lodge. Oh, total beast. Oh, I don't doubt it. Well, 20 chicken thighs in it. Yeah, of course, you also have the world's best pizza pan and also the world's best turkey roasting pan. Hint, hint. The holidays are still a few months away, but, well, they are slowly approaching. <laughs> um, HB, American Boiler and Foundry Company. Oh, thank you, Richard Scott, 1937, 1938. Wow, thank you very much. I did not know that. That's very interesting, and I'm very, and I'm really, honestly, thank you so much for telling me that. I'm really glad that it's identified. American Boiler and Foundry Country Company, huh? <laughs> Now, I'm trying to, I'm also wondering why they had a little thing like that. I mean, you know how we talk about salesman samples, and there's almost no such thing, especially when you talk about um, toy store, toy stoves, where everyone seen at every antique mall across the country is always a <clears throat> salesman sample. However, in this instance, I would actually wonder if that may very well have been. Oh, that one turned out okay. A sample of a uh, larger size ham boiler. Regardless, I'm still very glad to own it. And I really, no, thank you very, very much for that. I really, really appreciate that. Do you have a kale skillet? That's Cahill kale. Never seen one, but people talking about them on the internet. I know nothing about it. I'm not even familiar with the name. I would have to look it up. Is it a modern day or is it a vintage? I honestly do not know. Sorry to say that. Uh, hot and humid here in Michigan. And hey, well, Papa Dan, how goes it? Yeah, Papa Dan is still caring for his dad, but at least his dad is still getting by. Um, I'm going to make a cold pork and baked bean recipe. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, enjoy yourself. I mean, I'm really proud of that recipe, and it flatters me very much when people actually make it. And so far... Just about everybody I know who's made it has liked it. I think I better push this down. Still, we're off to a good start here. As I said, I've only done six out of these 12 tortillas, but still, we're do not doing too badly. Anyway, where was I? I was in Seaverville, uh, Tennessee. As I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there, including that gigantic flea market, including the Smoky Mountain Knife Works, including the Lodge Cast Iron Store. I did see at least one other antique mall in that same area. And again, I don't even know if it's still in business or not. You know, the pandemic, unfortunately. Um, I remember browsing through it, and I think I saw a couple of nice little things. Nothing that really, really caught my eye. Maybe I'm jaded when I say that, and I don't even blink now when I see those gate marked stove kettles. You know, they call them the bulge kettles, the 19th century uh, really wide kettles with the uh, smaller, round, smaller narrow bottoms that are meant to fit inside the eye of a stove. Um, maybe because I see them all the time, but also because almost always they are, unfortunately, they hold the uh, bottoms are either rusted through or they have holes punched in them. It's pretty rare, actually, to find one of those in a decent condition. I think this will be enough there. <laughs> Anyway, I have gone to Seaverville. Also in Tennessee, I had some pretty good luck in the Knoxville area, Knoxville, Tennessee. There was actually, it's been a few years now, but there was a nice row of antique stores in the Knoxville area, so much so that it was really worth uh, going out of my way to look for them. They were nice to browse. Um, I don't recall making any out. I, you know, life-changing scores there, but I did find some nice things there. Oh, yeah, how could I forget? It was there in Knoxville. Where is he? Here he is. And I found this guy. I found him for seven, it was 750 there in, uh, at an antique store in the Knoxville area. 
he caught my eye and he was covered with paint. You know, he had been painted green, but there was just something about him that I just really had to take him home. And I gave him a nice soak in the lye tank and I gave him some seasoning. So he now lives in my oven. Hmm. And, it, and I found him at an antique store there in Knoxville. Oh, I remember one other thing from Knoxville. Uh, two things. It was in Knoxville that I saw so far my only sighting of a large nine stick corn stick pan. So that was nice. It was also there in Knoxville that I did come across a, the Lodge 2001, you know, the September 11th, 2001 Memorial Skillet, the one that has an American Eagle on it and the slogan, United We Stand. I did actually pick that up and cleaned it up, and I actually sold that one on Iron Man, the Iron Man Facebook group, several years ago, in fact. It was part of a fundraiser or something. I forget what it did, but I, but I did actually sell it. And I don't regret it. It was. You know, I'm, glad, I'm glad to have found it, and and I'm glad that uh, somebody bought it. <laughs> All right. Meanwhile, where are we now? Another yet another tortilla. Okay. Let's pull out another piece of um, wax paper here. So far, I I like to think we're doing pretty good here, especially since. Where are we? Oh, yeah, here we go again. We're already at the hour and 10 mark. <laughs> this is hour 10 mark. Boy, and I've been talking and talking and talking, and I haven't even mentioned. I, okay, I think I'll mention one more, and then we'll probably get close to wrapping up because, you know, we've got a nice plate of our tortillas here. I'd say this has uh, turned out pretty nicely, so, and I'm looking forward to having these because I'll say again, these homemade tortillas, they really kick butt over the store-bought ones. The store-bought ones are okay, and there's nothing wrong with them, especially when you dress them up. But the to but the homemade ones, oh, they're so much better. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'll mention one more thing, and then I guess we'll probably call it an evening because, yeah, this has gone really a lot long longer than I expected. <laughs> anyway. Um, so actually, yeah, because now we're getting close to... <laughs> The law, yeah, close to South Pittsburgh, where Lodge is. <laughs> this is when I went on my road trips. And that is maybe about 90 minutes north of South Pittsburgh. There is the town of Sweetwater, Tennessee. And it's there in Sweetwater that, in the first place, the uh, entire front, the entire downtown area of that town, when I last was there, maybe about three or four years ago, had been turned into uh, antique stores. And there seemed to be some really, really nice selection down there, too. That's Sweetwater, Tennessee. I would say, though, after a couple of years, unfortunately, some of those antique stores had closed and gone out of business. So I can only hope that uh, they're still doing okay down there in Sweetwater. It was in Sweetwater that I found one particular antique store that had a nice selection of cast iron cauldrons. You know, we're talking about the big cauldrons. Not as big as mine. No, I won't I, you know, kind of brag and say that, but really nice cauldrons, maybe like in the five to 10 gallon range. And they were vintage too. And not at bad prices. I think we're probably like talking on the order of maybe about a hundred dollars or, or so. And for an antique cauldron, that's not bad at all. And this was it. also, though, one other thing. In Sweetwater, and again, I really hope this has not gone out of business. If you know the area of Sweetwater, Tennessee, then you know about the Sweetwater Flea Market, which is another gigantic flea market, at least on the order of that uh, Saturday's market up in Pennsylvania. It's huge, maybe about a quarter mile long or so. And it is, of course chock full of all your usual uh, flea market stuff. Outside the, uh, outside the Sweetwater flea market, I'm hoping they're still there, but there is not one, but three antique stores that are chock to the brim with rusty, and I'm talking rusty and dirty and stuff, including a lot of cast iron. When I was there, two of those stores were managed by the same person. And he was actually a shyster. 
He was selling the uh, Rusty Griswolds, Rusty um, BSR, which he did not know what it was, Rusty Wagners, you know, he only knew the brand names, uh, for rather high prices. And it was also there, I saw him selling, or on his rack, a number zero Griswold ashtray skillet. One of those fake Griswold ashtray skillets, you know, the counterfeit. And I pointed that out to him. You know, this one is a counterfeit. He said, I know that, and continued to sell it anyway. This, again, was at the Green um, Sweetwater Flea Market. Despite that, I did buy a couple of pieces from him. I bought a BSR Century uh, from him for about 10 bucks. And I think it was there, maybe it was, that I found a uh, BSR cornbread pan, too. On the other hand, right next door to that, as I mentioned, there were three of those antique shops. It was there that I found lightning. I think I've told you about lightning. Now, this shop was not owned by the same guy, not by the same shyster. And they did not know what they were selling, and I ended up paying $20 for it. What I got was my number seven handwritten BSR. Let me, let me see if I can pull that one out. Um, what did I do? I've shown this one to you. I found this there at the flea, at the uh, Sweetwater Flea Market, and again, I paid twenty bucks for it. It's a uh, BSR handwritten seven P, and it has these little they are casting flaws on them. They are not cracks. And this thing, as I found out, is a terrific frying pan. This thing will heat up in lightning time, which is why I call it lightning. And anyway. Okay, let me finish this thing and then put it on the uh, pan and read some more of your comments. And I think we'll probably call it an evening because, as I said, we have gone a lot longer than I thought. But I'm hoping at least, if nothing else, I've been able to get, I've been able to, uh, get my point across. You know, the hunt, treasure hunting for cast iron at flea markets, at yard sales, at, even at antique malls. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy browsing. I love making a good score, but I enjoy browsing. And that's really what I'm going to Brimfield for more than anything else, to browse. I usually find a good score at Brimfield, yes. But what I'm really looking forward to is browsing. And yes, I do intend on making a video of that, too. So, <laughs> all right, let's do this. And then, as I said, I will check your comments once again. Thank you once again for everybody who has hung around tonight. I hope I haven't bored you too much. Okay. And yeah, this wax paper is running out too anyway. So I'd say this is definitely means it's getting time to end this. Anyway, this is such a rich subject. We're really going to have to come back to this too. Not just the tortillas, but I mean, you know, the, the hunt, the vintage hunt. And the wax paper is even sticking. I'm going to watch myself here. Um, there we go. Okay. Here we go again. Last one. I've got five more to go, but I'm not going to bore you with that. And once again, what do we have here? Hi, all. I found an H.W. and Company Pitts, Pennsylvania. Best I can find is made between 1870 and 1873. Congratulations, Jeff Hill. So... James Ramsdale, seasoning some pie irons and going to try some ham and cheese. Oh, that sounds good. Bob S., my neighbor had a 36-inch cauldron hanging in his yard. <laughs> Finally, someone came along and made an offer and bought it. I'll have to ask what they paid. <laughs> and Bookworm73, the hunt is what it's all about. So fun to look and get great scores. Oh, absolutely. But that's the, uh, that's the other thing. The looking is as much fun as the, as the scores, especially since the scores can be rare and far between. Papa Dan. Kale is vintage cast iron produced by Kale Ironworks of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Huh. 
I don't know what years, but they've been out of business for a long time. I passed through Chattanooga on my way to uh, the Lodge factory, and I and I really have not made any ma any major stops there, unfortunately. But um, as I said, unfortunately, I, I really know very little about kale, but I'll have to look into it. So let's make sure. Oh yeah, sure enough, starting to smoke already. Do this right. I'm starting to bubble too, so I'm glad about that. Let's see Yeah, I know. Most of them have turned out like that, unfortunately. Okay. All right. So, anyway. Oh, sure. Hey, if, uh, are you saying you're hungry? I want a dang quesadilla. All right. Make yourself a dang quesadilla, then. Remember, we've just made this one raw, though, so... All right, I guess this one's not going to be part of the project. <laughs> not now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we are an hour and 20 into this, and it looks like we're getting a bonus here. We are cooking ourselves up a dang quesadilla. So, <laughs> okay, let me, let me move the camera over so that you'll have room to maneuver here. And don't worry. You're, I mean, this will only show your, your uh, midsection here, so. I, oh, well, well, no, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm oh, just, better. I'm trying not to embarrass you. You know, oh. you know, you, you know what I mean. Yeah, it's, it's only sure it's oh, Yeah, okay. Loves right. It, so. <laughs> well, okay. And the is pretty nice. My age? Yes. Bob S. It was a big one. I figured 200 gallons. Holy crap. Two people had to lift it. I have no idea about the, about that. Wow. That sounds like the type of thing that they make booyah in. I'm sure folks in the Midwest know about booyah. And yeah, that's one of those things I still have yet to make. Booyah is the Midwestern cousin, that didn't close, of Brunswick stew. And Mulligan stew. Okay. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, yeah, that's uh, Bob S. Anyway. Oh, yeah, i got to turn it back up again. I'm sorry. I forgot. You're right. Well, on the other hand, at least it didn't burn on the on the uh, bottom. That, that much I can say. So, oh, and some chicken. We'll, what do you need? Okay. All right. Pretty much, yeah. The rest of the cheese will melt anyway. So. Um, I don't know these are gonna be there we go. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Done. Dinner. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Um, Let me get your plate quickly. Oh. No plate, actually. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, there we go. So anyway, Jamie's got herself a nice little dang quesadilla. And I have five more uh, tortillas to make, but again, I won't bore you folks with it. I think I've gone on enough about that. Um, I guess I'll just say... What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know what you mean. No. Yeah, no. Uh, can you pass me those tongs, please? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. I guess the best thing I can say, if nothing else, is in addition to this, is that if you have not yet made homemade tortillas you know take some time at least once as a project do it with your kids carefully and um make some homemade tortillas they're very easy to make as you can see if someone like me can make these anyone can make them and they are very much worth it i mean yes I, i'm not going to give up store-bought tortillas because they're cheap and easy, I'm not going to go on about that, <laughs> but uh, they're, you know, they're, it's really easy to use store-bought tortillas. However, these are worth it. There we go. Look at that. Exactly. These are worth it. <laughs> and they're very simple. The trick, of course, is you use lard. <laughs> all right. Having said all that, Jose, the whole chat. Oh, Bookworm73. Do you want to I, chicken? Oh, here's a comment for you, Jamie. Miss French Twist. That Jamie don't mess around. She's all business. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm short order cook. Really yes, indeed. You're a short order cook. So. Well, uh, mate, well. Cook, 
Well, you're you're well, you're not that short. So I'm actually five seven. Really yeah. Short, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm hooked. Yes, indeed. As Miss French Twist says, I'm hooked on the hunt. And that's really how it goes. And yeah, I am really looking forward to this weekend when I'm finally gonna return to Brimfield. There is still a chance that there's gonna be rain, but I'm gonna do what I can nonetheless. <laughs> oh Anyway, thank you once again to everybody for staying here while I've uh, talked myself blue in the face yet again. I can only hope that you find it entertaining. One thing we just showed an example of is the fact that you can actually show order cook in a cast iron skillet. Yes, you can. Not, not everything in cast iron has to be like slow and low. No, that's... You can actually do fast things like grow cheese, um, like the quesadilla, for instance, that mm -hmm. would follow what... Two minutes, maybe. Oh yeah, no, that's true. So, so. Yeah. anyway, night, night to Papa Dan. So night yeah, Papa Dan. yeah. Thank you again for showing up. And you know, the, yeah, the, 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 the here, right? yeah. Uh, yes, she is. And, yeah, and um, Bookworm seventy three. Hmm. Um, and all the rest. And thank you very much William for showing Hart. up every week. So. Hmm. I can't remember what it is. And Wyo Drifter. Oh, Wyoming Drifter. Good good thing too, Papa. Dan, yes. Yeah, stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Stay safe, everyone. And that's uh, really, I think, where we can uh, pretty much call this a night. So, uh, as always, though, I very, really, really appreciate everybody who's shown up. I, I have a lot of fun in these things. And yeah, even though I've done nothing but talk tonight and well and cook some tortillas but i mean it's really you folks watching that makes this a lot of fun i've got five more tortillas to make for instance and doing them off camera i'm going to be doing a lot less talking <laughs> so thank you everybody for hanging around and i really as always thank you very much for watching and once again see you all next wednesday folks good night